Yeah, David, any chance you know anybody that can buy the $5,000 maxed out 16 inch MacBook Pro that I bought a month ago? Because that's how good the M1 Max are. But don't take my word for it. Just, just go try them out. Yo, David, have you got the new M1 MacBook Pro yet? Because I've tested it out. It's as fast as promised. Battery life is incredible. So go, go, go get one right now. Run your tests, make a video. It might just change your workflow. Yep. That's good, man. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Fine, I'll try it. After putting it off for a while and ignoring my friends, I figured I would finally give in and I would do a real world test on it. Now I'm gonna test my normal workflow, which means a lot of writing and surfing the web and doing research, but also photo editing as well as video editing. Now the thing is though, that most people I've seen praise this laptop are, including my two buddies that you just saw, um, are Final Cut Pro users, which is Apple's own editing software. And we'll talk a bit later as to why the performance boost that they got was kind of expected. But I wanna know, according to market research, the more popular video editing programs like Premiere Pro, for example, and then also the up and coming, less popular, but gaining a lot of momentum, DaVinci Resolve. Okay, but now that I finally got the computer all set up and it's fully charged, first things first. Coffee, check. Okay, so firstly, I actually went and bought the lowest spec MacBook Air with the M1 chipset. So it's the one with the eight gigs of memory, 256 gigs of storage, an eight core CPU, but a seven core GPU, unlike the eight core ones that you can also get. Now I've seen, as I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen at this point, that the seven core and the eight core GPUs, there's not much of GPU performance difference. It's not significant enough. So what I wanted to simply test was with the lowest model, the cheapest laptop with an M1 in it, what could you do with that? Okay, so I've been writing and researching in Chrome, again, testing like what has more market share and is technically more popular, um, but I've been using the M1 optimized version of Chrome. Um, which they released a week ago and is optimized for this chipset. I'm actually working on a decoder episode, which is my explainer series here on the channel. Um, if you haven't seen it, leave a link below. You can check it out. I appreciate it. But in that, I'll go through kind of more of the intricacies of ARM processors, which is what the M1 chipset is, versus x86 processors, which is what, like, say, Intel uses and what you're kind of used to on a computer. But for brevity's sake, in this video, if a program was designed specifically for the chipset that it's running on, you're gonna get a lot more benefits in terms of performance and battery life, etc. Now, since most programs for computers are x86 and this is ARM, developers essentially need to recode their programs to run natively on the new chipset in order to get all those benefits. Now, because this will take time, Apple released Rosetta 2, they call it, which is their built-in program that whenever you try to run an x86 application, again, the vast majority of the ones you'll probably be using, it essentially translates it so that the x86 code will run on the ARM M1. Now this all happens behind the scenes, and so far in my testing today at least, works pretty well with just some slight delay in a few programs opening, but nothing crazy or significant. All of this will become more important for our testing today though in a bit, when we get back to the studio. In the meantime, I've been using the laptop here outside at this coffee shop for about an hour and 15 minutes and we went from 100% to 94%. Battery life. So far so good. Got another coffee on the way out. It's, you know, duh. Okay, and now let's 
test out the battery life and the performance with some photo editing. Okay, so I have a raw photo for my Sony a7S III in Lightroom. And again, this version of Lightroom is not optimized for the M1. It's being emulated using Rosetta 2. So let's click auto really fast and just see how that does. Quick enough. All right, then I'm gonna move the sliders around and just kind of see how that feels. Seems pretty normal. It's pretty responsive. Yeah, seems fine. Okay, so now let's export this into Photoshop really quick. And I'm gonna grab the magic wand tool um, and use that to select some of the foreground, namely myself and the phone here. Um, and I'm doing this instead of like manually selecting out because it just uses a little more computational power. So I kind of want to test that out, um, but yep, seems fine. So let's create another layer via copy. And then we can go into adjustments and let's, uh, I don't know, let's adjust the shadows up a tiny bit. And then let's use the magic wand tool again. And now we'll grab just the phone from that layer and make a copy of that. And we'll adjust the shadows on that a little bit. And then let's mess with the vibrance and the saturation. Uh, okay. All right, well, we're starting to see a little bit of slowdown here. Uh, let's give it a sec. Okay. And yeah, that, yep. And beach ball. Okay, well, if we open activity monitor, uh, the screen capture program is using some power. So let's kill that and switch over to my real camera over my shoulder. And then let's go to vibrance again. And let's try again. Yeah, feels the same. And eh, beach ball again. Okay, well, again, uh, this version of Photoshop is not optimized for this chipset, but there is a beta version going around that is optimized for the M1 chipset. So let's download that real quick. And I'll just quickly get us back to where we were. And now let's mess with the vibrance and the saturation again. And now no issue whatsoever. Works pretty well, actually. But upon trying to export it, it just, it doesn't work. And that's again, because it's a beta. And it, if you look at Adobe's website, there are plenty of known bugs and it is very much a beta, but it just kind of goes to show that when something is optimized for the chipset, how much better it works, I guess, right? Okay, and after all that, let's check in on the battery. I've been photo editing or attempting to in some cases, and we are at 78% after an hour and a half. Okay, so now let's try to edit some video and we'll do it in Premiere Pro, which is also, again, not optimized for the M1. Now I've imported all my footage and let's drag something into the timeline and just try to play it back. And it can't, even at 1 8th resolution. Okay, so I have a feeling that has a lot to do with the format that I'm shooting in. I'm using this like Sony a7S III with 4KI at 422, like 10 bit color. It's just, it's a lot usually for a lot of computers. So let's actually take some footage of my buddy Jaime here uh, that I shot in 420, still in 4K, but not as tough on a computer. And let's pull that into the timeline and try to play that back. Oh, and that that seems to work fine. Um, even at full resolution, I'm not turning into like quarter or half or any of that. Um, so that's, that's pretty impressive, actually. All right, now let's try DaVinci Resolve, which actually has a beta that does support the M1. So anxious to see how that makes a difference. So I'm gonna pull in that footage that is again, that you know super tough format for most computers. And already um, the thumbnails are all generated. It just feels a lot smoother. So that's a good start. And let's pull something to the timeline and try to play it back. Okay, working just fine actually. And again, at full resolution. Okay, and here is now a full project that I have edited before. Um, and we'll just pull that in here and let's play some of that back and just see with all the stuff in there, like a real world scenario, uh, can it play it back? Okay, and it's struggling a little bit. So let's change the playback resolution to one half and try that again. Okay, much smoother. Oh, and yeah, now that there's two 4K 30 videos on the screen at the same time, which are from the iPhone, that has slowed it down again. So. Let's swap it down to quarter resolution, which is the lowest we can go here and try one more time. Oh, it's better, but it's not, not quite smooth, I would say. But I mean, it plays back 
every other part of this video besides this one segment. Um, and I, I mean, yeah, that's kind of impressive. Okay, now finally, let's just render this out in DaVinci just because I'm kind of curious to see how long that takes. Okay, it took about 30 minutes. And in all that time of editing and rendering for about two hours and 15 minutes, we lost 57%, which might seem like a lot, but let's try something. Let's try the same video on my usual crazy editing laptop, which is a 2020 Razer Blade 15 Studio Edition. Now I've gone ahead and unlinked and relinked all of the media from the external SSD instead of the internal one, just to make sure this is an apples to apples comparison. And we'll leave the blade unplugged as well. And let's see how that does. It rendered the video in 14 minutes, but it went from 79% when I started to just 36% in 26 minutes of unlinking, relinking footage, and then the render. All right, now let's plug in the blade and render again to show you something else that I think is interesting. So that finished in six minutes and 51 seconds. And not only that, but scrubbing the footage is smoother, even on full resolution, etc. Now I plugged in the MacBook and I re-rendered that video again, and it did it in about 30 minutes again. As near as makes no difference, the same amount of time. Now I mentioned this because it's sort of always just known that if you have a high-end editing or a gaming laptop, that the performance can vary tremendously from when you are unplugged versus when you are plugged in. Now for me, I kind of just know that if I have to edit a video, I have to sit still, I have to be plugged in. I either have to be here at the studio plugged in or at my house. And that's one, because of the extra performance that I need when it's plugged in versus when it's not. It's much harder for me to edit if, and sometimes I can't edit if I'm not plugged in. And then also, of course, as you saw, the battery dies really quickly as soon as you open up any type of editing program at all. The MacBook M1 seems that the performance doesn't matter whether it's plugged in or not. You're not sacrificing anything by, you know, being at the coffee shop and editing versus being plugged in somewhere else, um, which is kind of cool. Now, that's kind of a MacBook thing. I know that other friends of mine, like the ones you've seen, have their MacBook Pro 16, and that's kind of always been the case for them as well. But where the M1 kind of beats out their MacBooks is the fact that I know they probably can only edit away from a plug for about 75 minutes or so. This one, obviously, as you can tell, will be able to do it for a lot longer. All right, though, it's getting super late, so let's head home and I'll summarize my thoughts about this device. Hey, how's it going? All right, I'm doing good. Okay, uh, let's go over some closing thoughts. Firstly, I get it. I get why everyone is gushing about the MacBooks with the M1 chipset. I mean, the battery life is much better, although that was kind of expected whenever you switch from x86 to ARM. But the bigger surprise was just how much better the performance was. Now, a lot of that comes down to optimization. In Final Cut Pro, the editing software that most people using a Mac are probably using is a good example. Ask any of those editors using Final Cut Pro on a Mac, and they'll tell you that it runs way better than any other editing software on a PC with similar power, and in a lot of times, even more power. And this comes down to the fact that on a PC, you have the editing software manufacturer, then Microsoft, the OS manufacturer, then Intel or AMD, the CPU manufacturer, then Intel, AMD, or NVIDIA as the GPU manufacturer, and then finally, Dell, HP, Razer, whoever, as the laptop manufacturer, and all of their stuff has to work together as optimized as it can. With Final Cut and Apple, you have Apple as the editing software manufacturer, Apple as the OS manufacturer, Apple as the laptop manufacturer, and then Intel and AMD as the CPU, GPU manufacturer, which as you can imagine is much easier for Apple to optimize because the majority of it is all well under their roof. And now with the M1 computers, they brought that CPU, GPU combo in-house as well. And so they can optimize essentially the entire stack now. Think of it like a super lightweight, 200 horsepower, really efficient car versus say a very heavy 600 horsepower muscle car, right? The second one on paper 
should definitely win, right? But if that first one has a better power to weight ratio, let's say better suspension, et cetera, et cetera, it might keep up with it. It might even beat it. Regardless of this being Apple's first attempt at this, it'll be interesting to see what the second attempt is like. And also even more interesting to see what like Intel, Nvidia, AMD, all the other manufacturers do in response to this. Like who else can do this but Apple because they own that much of the stack? Like how will all those other companies work together to optimize as efficiently as Apple has? Personally, I'm very curious to see uh, what happens to Premiere when it gets optimized, uh, Photoshop as well, obviously, and also what happens to DaVinci when it comes out of beta. I'm also very curious to maybe get my hands on a 16 gig model. Now, the reason for that is that Apple actually did something kind of clever. Instead of the eight gigs of RAM in this case, just being used as RAM, they're actually allowed to be used by the GPU as well. So eight gigs is not really a lot of RAM, right? But it is a lot of memory for your GPU to use. Now it might not be as fast as the memory that you know Nvidia and AMD are using in their big GPUs, but at 16 gigs, I mean, it's a lot. And I'm curious to see if that makes any sort of difference when it comes to especially like editing my videos. Stay tuned though, as I might try to get a MacBook Pro in that 16 gig spec. Um, subscribe if you're not already and ding the bell next to subscribe so you get notified when I do new videos. Also, if you wanna check out more videos on the M1 MacBook and how it did, check out my buddy MJ. He did a great video over on Gadget Match, which I'll link below. And also my buddy Jaime Rivera, who will be doing a video on Pocket Now shortly. Let me know in the comments below what you guys think of the new MacBook and also this format. I had a lot more of you staring at my screen than I would have liked, but I figured people wanted to see how the computer reacted. Regardless though, as always, thanks for watching.